Presenting the world's greatest mysteries. And now, your host. This is Basil Rathbone. In drama and fiction, newspaper men are invariably tough, hard-boiled characters. In real life, this is, well, it's not necessarily true, although several newspaper men I've known were as colorful as anything fiction has ever had to offer. Mike, whom you'll meet in a moment, is based on a real person who actually works for the European edition of a famous American newspaper. Not only is the character real, but, uh, well, many of the stories which Mike tells are also based on fact. The tale you're going to hear today, for instance, you may even recognize from the headlines in your newspaper of, well, not so long ago. In a moment, Mike will introduce you to another mystery solved and signed with his own unmistakable trademark. Europe Confidential. Presenting Europe Confidential. Why have they sent you, Mike? Because you are so experienced in espionage? Well, of course not. That isn't the reason. Then you know, Mike. You know why people like you are sent on missions like this? No, I can't say I do. Because you do not matter at all, that is why. Because they do not care what happens to you one little bit. Because you are... How do you say? Expendable. In a moment, we'll bring you Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy, the Paris correspondent of a famous American newspaper, in another exciting story in our series... Europe Confidential. I write a column called Europe Confidential for the Paris edition of an American paper. You know, it's a strange thing, but the Army and I never got along very well together. Somehow I never rose above the rank of private. And maybe it was because the brass hats and I never quite saw eye to eye. Well, this story I want to tell you is about my same old European beat, but switch the clock back a few years, 1943 to be precise, and picture private detention before a certain general who was about as happy as a nature lover in the wintertime. And the reason for his happiness, yeah, yours truly. I don't know why they don't take you out of here and put you behind a newspaper desk. As a soldier, you're about the worst I have in my army. Well, thank you, General. Nice to have confirmation. You mean you agree? No, sir. I mean your officers have been telling me that ever since we hit the English coast. Trouble with you newspaper guys, you don't know the meaning of discipline. Sir... I'd like to see you in the study room of the Chronicle making us slope typewriters. You'd be a riot. I'd like you to remember, I am your commanding officer. Yes, sir. 
Would the fact that you don't like me as a soldier have anything to do with the fact that we worked for rival newspapers back home? That I once scooped you on a very important assignment? Nothing at all. The newspaper business is a long way behind me. The Army's my career now. Yes, sir. Now, listen. You report to the address on this slip of paper. It's a tailor on Savile Row. The tailor has his instructions. He's to make you three suits, including the full suit and fish, and the whole outfit, so it'll be ready in 48 hours. What? Wait a minute. It gets worse. You go to the Savoy Hotel. You know where that is? Yes, sir. A room is reserved there for you. You'll register as a civilian. For purposes of cutting red tape, you're going to be a civilian. Oh. But here are your papers. You'll be taking a trip pretty soon. Yes, we're sending you away from all these bombs. Isn't that awful? <laughs> yes, sir. I wish we were dropping you by parachute into Bechtel's garden. But as it is, you're going to a nice, cozy, neutral country to have a long visit with a beautiful girl. <laughs> it's discouraging. I tell you, this whole army is as nutty as a fruitcake. I didn't say that, did I? Uh, no, sir, you didn't. Yes, the Allied Command is sending you on a holiday, and you're traveling as a civilian with the rank of a full colonel. <laughs> That's what I mean about brass, an unfriendly attitude. Unnecessary, I call it. Since we were old newspaper buddies, why couldn't the general have been nice? Well, if he was, I guess he wouldn't have been a general. Of course, if you look at it that way, I was going to have to begin changing my loyalties because, according to my papers, well, I was part of the brass now myself. I got my new suits, and then they sent me to see a certain Captain Smith. I don't think that was his real name. He was something very high in the hush-hush department. It was all set up for midnight on the right side of Cleopatra's Needle. Oh, I can tell you the whole thing was very cloak and dagger. Sir, could you give me a light? We're not supposed to show a light. That's correct. What was in the bottle? Jenkins' ear. Put out. How did Morgan die? He died at Governor. Splendid. All the answers perfectly correct. Silly questions, what? Silly answers, too, come to think of it. But the silliness makes it easier to remember, I always think. All right, if you say so, Captain Smith. Let's get down to cases. We have borrowed you from your people because of your special qualifications. Languages, looks, a certain rather celebrated aptitude for the opposite sex, and a fair share of unmitigated gall, plus a knowledge of Europe and some of the people you'll be meeting. Uh, yes, sir. Don't call me sir. Remember, this isn't the army, not strictly speaking. No, this is another show. What do you think of spying? Well, I don't know. I never tried. It's a dirty business, of course. Absolutely filthy. But then it's a profession like anything else. Yeah, I suppose so. For one thing, the pay is abominable. That's why so many of the regular pros turn double agent on us. You know what a double agent is, don't you? Well, yeah, I guess so. An agent who sells out to another power. Yes. We're on to most of that lot, of course. We use them when we can, but it's always sticky. No doubt about that. Sticky. <laughs> Another one of those V2s. That was in Chelsea, I'd say. Appalling weapons, aren't they? Guided missiles. Yeah. I'll tell you something, because it's going to be part of your job. This V2 is nothing. Oh? Well, Jerry is getting ready with some something a great deal worse in the same line. About ten times worse, according to our information. Yes, somewhere in Europe, more than a hundred feet underground, there's a factory where they're busy perfecting quite a new thing. We have got to stop them. Want to help? Well, sure, but how? Your work has to do with an agent of ours working in Istanbul. You didn't ever happen to meet a female named Greenall, did you? No, I don't think so. Reddish blonde, sometimes auburn. Gray eyes, rather tall, speaks eight languages perfectly, five or six more well enough. <laughs> she's been a professional agent for more than 15 years. Good at her work, too. Yes, yeah, she's been quite valuable to us off and on. This, it appears, is one of the off times. Oh? Very much off. She was due to send us something rather important. Um, you know, I gave you a hint about that. You mean this new rocket factory? Mm. Uh, Grenall has the information about where it is, and she won't send it. Worse. She's given us false information. We think the Germans have some sort of hold over her. Blackmail or something beastly. We'd like you to see if you can't get some sort of line on just what it is. 
We don't really expect you to succeed, but go down and have a try, won't you? Yeah, but what do I do? Where do I go? You'll receive sealed instructions when you get on the plane. Details, background, all that sort of thing. Yeah, but, but look... I, See I... that car across the way? Yeah. It's waiting to take you to the airport. Well, good hunting. <laughs> Hey, pilot! Pilot! Yes? That doesn't look like the Bosporus to me. No, it doesn't at that. It looks like the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, but don't you know what it says in my instructions? Oh, mustn't tell that, you know. Those instructions are supposed to be secret. Well, that's all very well, but I'm under orders to proceed to Istanbul. And here we are in... Well, where are we, anyway? Well, this flight isn't part of your show at all. We just happen to be carrying you, if you see what I mean. A little out of your way, of course, but there's an awful lot of red tape attached to getting in and out of these neutral countries. Yeah, but look, my instructions... Don't worry. There's bound to be some one of our chaps waiting to take you the rest of your journey tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, relax and enjoy Lisbon. We're coming in now. Oh, so that's where we are. Yes. Better fasten your seatbelt. Wizard place, Lisbon. Sure enough, they had me all fixed up for a flight to Turkey in the morning. Well, I wasn't complaining. There weren't any rockets falling on Lisbon, and anyway, it's always been one of my favorite places for having a good time. I checked into the hotel, changed into my new white tie and tails, and took a cab out to the casino at Estoril. Comment vas-tu? Genevieve, what are you doing in Lisbon? Oh, my dear, in this city there are two things we try to avoid. Huh? The first is never, unless it is absolutely necessary, to address a friend by name. After all, you know, one's name may not be one's name anymore. <laughs> all right, honey, but what's the second rule? It is a most strict one. We observe it very carefully. Yeah, fine, but you can't expect me to obey the law if I don't know it. You asked me what I was doing in this one. Oh, that's it. Sherry, no matter what the provocation, we never, never, under any circumstances, ask each other what we are doing in this one. <laughs> well, I'm perfectly willing to tell you what I'm doing. Oh, don't bother. Well, why not? I've got a good job. Oh? Yep. I represent the biggest Swedish manufacturers of ball bearings. Tomorrow, I'm hmm? going up to Stockholm. To Stockholm? By way of Istanbul? Oh, you mean you know? Oh, Sherry, in Lisbon, you said everyone knows everything about everybody, and no one asks anybody anything. Oh. The first is a question of pride, and the second of politesse. Oh, it's very warm in here. Shall we go out on the terrace? Uh, am I allowed to answer that one, or must I tell you in code? <laughs> What are we allowed to talk about now? Oh, why should we talk? That's true. Why should we? Ah, oh, it was a nice kiss. You still do that very nicely, Mike, but... <laughs> What's the joke? You're such a terrible spy. Yeah, I guess I am at that. Now, listen, Mike. I've always liked you. I am not working for your people, but I know what you are up to. Don't go to Istanbul. Well, I haven't got any choice, honey, but I think I'd go anyway. You know me, curious as a cat. Why shouldn't I go? They put you onto something terribly big, Mike. Terribly important. Well, that's very flattering, isn't it? Tell me, what do you know about a woman called Grinall? Oh, she's been an agent a long time. I do not know her, but I've seen her once in St. Moritz and again in Deauville. Please, Mike, do not go to Istanbul. It is not a woman Grinall. It is a situation. I tell you, it is too big for an amateur. It is too big for anyone. Maybe, but well, I'm a lousy soldier. This is more like the old newspaper days. They've at least given me a chance to handle this deal. And why? Why have they sent you, Mike? Because you are so experienced in espionage? Well, of course not. That isn't the reason. Then you know, Mike. You know why people like you are sent on missions like this? No, I can't say I do. Because you do not matter at all, that is why. Because they do not care what happens to you one little bit. Because you are, oh, how do you say, expendable. <laughs> I was on my way and I'd been warned. Promptly at six the following morning, we took off from Lisbon Airport and made Istanbul in good time and without incident. Well, when you're on a story assignment and you don't know where to start, what do you do first? 
That's right. You look up some old friends. Which was why around 11 o'clock that night, once again in the white tie and tails, I made my way to Georgette's, an upholstered sewer masquerading as a nightclub. I left my top hat with a check girl and called for the head waiter. Good evening, sir. You are alone, monsieur? Perhaps I can get mine here at the table? Near the floor, senor? Where's Georgette? I beg pardon? Come on, you heard me, Georgette. Georgette? Yes, where is he? There's no one here by that name, sir. Unless possibly you are referring to Monsieur Racine. I wouldn't know, unless Mr. Racine used to be doing an act on a trapeze dressed like a girl in a blonde wig. Of course, that's a long time ago in Sir, Berlin. Sir, I have never in all my life traveled outside of Istanbul. I wouldn't but know... But why all this hocus-pocus and the mystery? Georgette's real name was George Beaton. And why I'm standing here telling you the story of your boss's life, I don't know. Look, wait a minute. I'll tell you. I hadn't bothered to show you the color of the dough. Here it is. This is for you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, please come this way. Throw here, sir. Thanks. If you will step through the kitchen, sir. Here we are. Excuse me. Yes, what is it? There is a gentleman here who says he knows you. Oh, yes. And who? Hiya, George. Mike, well, for Pete's sake. Uh, don't you think we'd uh, better be alone? Leave us now. Yes, Mr. Well, Mike, it's been a long time. Yes, it has. You're getting fat, old boy. You're also getting rich? Not so fat, Mike, and not so rich. Uh, how's the opium record? Now, Mike, you know I don't ever monkey with that stuff. You newspaper guys are all the same. Just when a man thinks you're a real pal, you start the old snoop. What are you after? Information. And I'm willing to pay for it. With money? With money. On top market price, too. You know an agent called Grenoll? Hmm, suppose I did. Who's shaking her down? Well, who wants to know? People with the dough, George. 500 English pounds. Mm, I could use it. All right, Georgie boy. Let's get down to cases, eh? Grenoll, she's a good looker. She has a sister. Oh, is that it? Our younger sister, called Julie. Mm-hmm. Where is she now? She's in Istanbul, too, but she isn't free to move around very much. You might say she's a guest at a certain embassy. What embassy? I prefer not to use proper names, Mike. Yeah, okay, I can guess. The sister's being held in a German embassy. Now, how long do they figure they can keep her? Mm, your guess is as good as mine, I'd say, for as long as Grinnell herself can be forced to function effectively. You mean as a double agent? Mm, of course. She must have got onto something good, and the Germans must be particularly anxious for her not to spill it. Mm -hmm. They're probably hoping to use her to lead your people just as far away from the truth as possible, and for as long as possible. And what happens when Grenoll gets tired of cooperating? Mm, she's very fond of that kid sister. Yeah, but what happens to her finally? To Julie, I mean. They knock her off, won't they? Yes, I should think so. Oh, Mike, it's been pleasant meeting you. Goodbye. <laughs> Miss Grinnell? What do you want? I came here to see you about Captain Jenkins. What about him? His ear's in a bottle. Also, there's Governor Morgan. Come in. Come in. Okay. No need for all that rigmarole. I know who you are. You used to work on the American Chronicle in Marseille in 37. I met you once in Monte Carlo. Now they've sent you from London. What is your message? Well, the message is supposed to come from you, Miss Grinnell. There's about 500 RAF planes waiting for the address of a certain rocket factory. The information has passed due. I've always given perfect satisfaction. My Good record... Look, is... save it, honey. Let's cut the whole thing down to facts, eh? Fact one, you know where that rocket factory really is. Fact two, I know where your kid sister really is. And fact three, get me that rocket factory and I'll deliver Julie. How can you do that? There are over 60 people in the embassy. She's up on the third floor. There are armed guards. Yes, they're giving a reception, aren't they? Tomorrow night? Who? The German embassy, honey. Now, don't go stupid on me. I want an invitation. But how can I do that? You can do it. You're working for them, aren't you? They don't know me here. I've got a pocket full of papers to prove I'm an American businessman from Columbus, Ohio, interested in opening a factory. Here's the name. Get me an invitation for that party and get yourself two tickets for Switzerland. You mean you really the think The plane that... leaves at 4.30 in the morning. Bring all the information on that rocket factory to the airport, and I'll bring Julie. 
Well, goodbye now. Sorry, but I've got to run. Where are you going? Yeah, you'd never guess. I'm going to play pinochle with the chief of the Turkish fire department. Goodbye for now. Oh, good evening, mine here. Mr. Cotton, isn't it? Yeah, I believe that is the name, Mr. Cotton. Uh, good evening, Mr. Ambassador. Very nice of you to invite me. It is our pleasure, Mr. Cotton. The German Reich is particularly interested in the development of industry. Yes, indeed. I would like to put a few questions to you privately, Mr. Cotton. Won't you please step this way? Uh, well, Mr. Ambassador, um, I... I won't keep you very long. Well, all right. Thank you. It is rash to talk serious business in this large public gathering. We will be much quieter in my study. Uh, yes, I dare say. Uh, uh, through here. Hey. Put up your hands high and keep them there. This gentleman, as you can see, is armed and this room is quite soundproof. He will not hesitate to use his gun. Uh, okay. Now what happens? We will discuss that a bit later. Now I must return to my guests. I will be interested to learn why you were so stupid as to come here. I must say that in my entire diplomatic career, I have never had anything made quite so simple for me. I will return later. Meanwhile, Gerhard here will keep you company. Well, Gerhard, here we are. Keep your hands up. The ambassador says I'm stupid, Gerhard. You agree with him? Also, Americans are stupid. <laughs> you think it would be stupid of me to... Try and get that gun away from you, Gerhardt? Yeah, I suppose it would, but anyway, I'm going to try. Uh, sorry I only got you in the leg, old boy, but I never was much of a shot. Fine! Yeah, what I need today is to practice my marksmanship, and since this is such a nice soundproof room... What are you doing? Uh, what'll I try for, Gerhardt? An arm or another leg? No! No! All right, then. Where's the girl? Cut girl! Oh. <laughs> that was your right hand, wasn't it, Gerhard? You see, my aim's getting better. It's practice that does it. Now, let's try for a foot. Huh? No! No! She's in there! Screw that door! Okay, thanks. Julie! Julie! What do you want? I'm not one of the Nazis, Julie. You'll have to take my word for it. I'm your sister's friend. Listen, they're coming. Yeah, we've just got time. Bolt the door. It won't do any good. This is the only way out. There's the window. There's no use. Yeah, the window's locked, isn't it? Here, give me that chair. I tell you, it's no use. One, two, three. I tell you, it's hopeless. There are big gardens on the side of the house. No one will hear. And besides, the embassy guards will be... Yeah, they're starting to break down the door. Jump, Julie. Through the window? Well, where else, you little fool? But it's four stories to the ground. I'll be killed. Jump, Julie. Go on, jump. Oh, very well. It doesn't matter. Perhaps it's better to die this oh, way. Oh, shut up and jump. Oh. That's a girl. Um, Put that gun down. Look out below, Julie. I'm coming after you. You wish to kill yourself? Well, Mr. Ambassador, you told me I was stupid. I'll be the same. <laughs> that night, there was seen in the streets of Istanbul one of the strangest sights in the history of that historic city. A procession of firemen bearing two bundles wrapped in canvas rushed out of the German compound and boarded a hook and ladder. Then out of the bundles, which were, of course, firemen's jumping nets, there emerged two figures. There too, Mr. Where do we take you? To the airport and step on it. I've been reading your report. Very interesting. Oh, thank you, sir. There's just one thing. Turkey is a neutral country. How did you manage to get all that cooperation from the fire department? Well, I used persuasion, sir. You'll find it all down on the expense account. I thought you might like to know, Private, that there was quite an air raid the other night over a certain factory on the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. The Germans won't be making that new rocket, Private. Not for some time, anyway. Well, I'm glad to hear it, sir. And I suppose you think we owe the whole thing to you, don't you, Private? Well, we don't. Uh, no, sir. That air raid was held three nights ago when you were in Lisbon. But... Grenoll wasn't the only source of information, not by a long shot. I'm instructed to tell you that the facts we were looking for were sent to us from Portugal, from an agent by the name of Genevieve. However, the Allied Command are very grateful for your help. 
They've asked me to give you this. Now, wait a minute. Where did I put it? Oh, sometimes I think this isn't a war at all, but a grand convention of lunatics. I didn't say that, did I, Private? Yeah, no, sir, you didn't. No, I didn't think I did. Ah, uh, here you are. This is from the Allied Command with their compliments. Thank you, sir. Uh, what is it? It's an address. They thought you might have lost it. It's that tailor in Savile Row. They want you to return the suits. <laughs> been listening to Lionel Merton as Mike Canoy in another exciting episode in the series, Europe Confidential. This is Basil Rathbone again. As Mike takes the copy out of his typewriter to file his story, our play for today comes to an end. Well, goodbye now till we meet again to listen to another of the world's greatest mysteries.